Okay, I'm going to start now then. Right, um, first things first, in case you didn't hear me say, um, open up Maya. So start Maya up, because uh, it takes a while to load up, because it's Autodesk. Uh, and just have it waiting there. And also make sure that you've downloaded these three files in the file exchange of uh, Lighting for Beginners 2. Three point lighting, village scene, and area lights. So just three Maya scenes. There's no textures or anything in them or anything like that. It's just geometry. Just um, uh, they're going to be our like little practice uh, scenes to play with. Um, the purpose of this workshop is to introduce you to some concepts and some foundational sort of um, behaviours of light, and the way that we can describe and break down a shaded image into the components that make it up. It's important, I think, to know this because it's going to mean that when you do your own lighting, if something is looking, for example, too flat, you will now know why it's looking too flat and you'll know how to make it look more 3D, if that's what you want to do. Sometimes you don't want a particularly 3D sculpted looking object, you want a flatter kind of image, and that's fair enough, as long as that is your intent. But we're going to get into that more kind of later. So I want, you, I want to introduce you to these kind of concepts and these fundamentals of the behaviour of light. Uh, and even more importantly, I want to introduce you to the ways of doing some basic lighting of characters and environments and how they're not too dissimilar from each other and give you some ways of practising this that are, are the, the most useful way of getting better at it. If you, go, if you go away from this and you're not interested in light at all, then fair enough. But if you are interested in making your stuff look better, and lighting is always going to make your stuff look better, really nice lighting can make the dodgiest looking model look really good. Um, that's sort of, well, that's, that's been known for ages, you know. A good photographer can uh, make even people like me look attractive if they light me nice enough. Um, and it's the same with all kind of lighting kind of setups. So if you want to get good at that, you're going to practice what I'm going to tell you. I think it's, personally, I think it's fun to practice. Um, you might think differently, but um, you should do it because you're going to get better at light if you practice in the way that I'm going to tell you to. Okay, so make sure you've got Maya loaded up and you make sure you've got those two scenes kind of loaded up. Um, first things first, um, so as an introduction rather than a sort of um, rant, I don't know, um, whether you're doing a piece of concept art or you're a visual effects artist, CGI visual effects person, uh, whether you're working in games, maybe you're working on a game level um, or a bit of game art or environment modelling or character modelling, I think it's lighting, maybe more than anything else, that has the most impact on the perceived mood and the atmosphere of the, of the end result, of the thing that you're doing. The same kind of textured model or the same painting, the same subject that you're painting, so it can be, if you're painting, it could, you could be painting um, just... I don't know, a living room. Um, by changing the lighting, you can make that living room look uh, inviting, you can make it look sinister, uh, melancholy, mysterious, any kind of atmosphere. The lighting, the change in the lighting, you can change the entire mood of, of anything, essentially, if you're doing it digitally. Personally, I enjoy doing lighting the most. Uh, I'm more of a um, VFX digital art kind of person rather than games. Um, I've done a little bit of game stuff in the past, but I enjoy lighting the most uh, more than anything else. Probably because um, even though I do enjoy modeling and I do to a certain extent enjoy texturing, especially that we, now that we can use things like Substance Painter, um, they're very, very long processes, modeling and texturing. And for a very long time, uh, what you're doing doesn't look good. It doesn't look pretty, so to speak. Once you get to the lighting stage of it all, uh, it begins to look pretty, it begins to look atmospheric and cool much quicker. And it also feels to me that um, if you are using things like, My um, not Maya, so to speak, um, but progressive renderers like Arnold that quickly update what the lighting looks like, it feels like a quick kind of process. So I can very quickly change the look of something when I'm lighting rather than when I'm modeling. If, I've, if I want to change my mind when I'm modeling, um, Geez, it means often going back hours and hours and hours and redoing stuff from scratch. Whereas lighting feels sort of quick and spontaneous and kind of playful. Uh, so that's why I like lighting the most. and uh, That's why I'm going to hopefully get my enthusiasm for it over to you. 
Um, before we look at actually doing some practice lighting, I think it's important to look at some of the behaviours of light and look at some of the ways that we can describe light. To my mind, um, lighting can be broken down into kind of two basic types. Uh, and they're direct light and local light. What are the differences between the two? Uh, let's look at direct light first. Direct light uh, can, well, direct light is light that comes from, so essentially light that comes from infinitely far away, or the end result of its behaviours and characteristics makes it feel like it's coming from infinitely far away. The two most obvious, or the main obvious example of direct light is the sun. Um, but you could also say that the moon was a kind of direct light as well, because again, it might be coming from an actual point in space, like the sun, but it's so far away that by the time the light rays hit us, uh, it effectively feels like it's a direct light. So the overall um, behaviour of a direct light is that direct light casts rays of light that they come at us and they're in parallel. So in reality, this is the sun, and over here is the earth. So the sun is a big ball floating in space, and it is casting its light out from all directions. But because the earth is so far away, and it's so tiny compared to the sun, that by the time a light ray from the sun hits the earth, like that, these two light rays here, I mean, look at that. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm not exaggerating it enough. The Earth is a lot farther away than the Sun. Uh, the, my um, little diagram is showing up here. But even with this kind of um, more sort of humble, smaller version of the example, two light rays that come out, and by the time they get to the Earth, one's at the top and one's at the bottom, they look, these two look almost parallel to each other. That's what a direct light source kind of means. Now, in some 3D programs like Maya, um, it's literally called a direct light. Um, I think it's called a direct light. Maybe it's called a parallel light. Let's just check. I always forget. No, it's called a direct light source. Yeah. I think in Max it might be called a parallel light source, um, or maybe it's just called a directional light source. But the, the gist of it is that the light rays are just parallel kind of light rays, even though, in reality, uh, the sun is a big ball in space and it is kind of like a giant floating kind of uh, light bulb. The end result is light rays that are completely parallel. What effect does that have on the look of a scene when, you, when it's lit? Well, as I mentioned, oh, that's to come a bit later. Um, as I mentioned, the sun is the most kind of obvious form. So let's have a look to see what light looks like when lit by the sun. What, what are the characteristics? Well, the light comes in completely parallel. So the most obvious thing is unless something is um, blocking the sun, the illumination is consistent. So the light over here is the same level in intensity as the light over here, as the light over in the far distant mountains and the light right up close. That's one thing. If there's nothing blocking the sun at all. Uh, another thing are the shadows. Maybe the shadows are even more of a dead giveaway. Shadows cast by the sun, or to a certain extent the moon, are direct, they're parallel again. So the shadows don't radiate away from, in different directions from the thing casting the shadow, in this case little tufts of uh, scrub grass. Um, they're kind of parallel lines. Let's look at a couple of other examples. So you've got this camel. Desert scenes are really good for obviously for showing off this because there's nothing obscuring uh, the sun. So you get this kind of long, thin strip of light. It's not radiate, radiating away from it, it's not fanning out, which is directly diff different from uh, a local light source. Got a few examples kind of bunched together here. Two we've already seen here, got these three, uh, these four chaps. Um, these shadows all being cast, they're all completely parallel to each other. We can see here what I've, I've over this girl, little girl here, is uh, traced over her shadow, and you can see you effectively get parallel lines. The whole thing is just one thin strip. Let's look at it in terms of CG. 
because it's a bit more graphic to kind of show it up. So in CG here, this is just a cylinder, given a kind of metal material, and then I've used a direct light source, which is uh, a direct light. And the shadows we get are completely parallel. Like that. So the sun and the moon both have these characteristics. You could, in some ways, argue the case that the sky is a kind of uh, direct light source because it is coming from a perceived infinite kind of distance away, but the sky has a completely different effect. It has no obvious direction. So when we talk about direct light sources, we're normally talking about a light that has direction only. It doesn't really matter where the light is. It only matters in what direction it's pointing. And we know then that our shadows are going to have this kind of look and that the floor here is just completely evenly lit doesn't matter where that light is. So if you're doing outdoor scenes and you want a hot sunny day and there's no clouds obscuring the sun, that's how you want to kind of portray your objects. You want them to have these parallel shadows and you want um, surfaces to be fairly evenly lit unless there's some justifiable reason where they're being covered. So maybe you've got a cloud that's casting a shadow. That would be one reason. But think of it in terms of desert is a good way to just sort of conceive it. So that's a direct light source which is uh, directly opposite to a local light source. So whereas a direct light source was light coming from what felt like um, infinitely far away, a local light source is local to the thing that's being shaded by it. So if I had a ball here on the ground, like that, I'm going to call that a mountain. And this is a river. So the sun up here would be a direct light source, but uh, oops, a street light over here, that would be a local light source. In some ways it's doing exactly the same thing as the sun. Light is coming at it from all directions, but because the size of this light source and the size of this um, grapefruit are relatively similar to each other, and relatively close to each other. A local light source is light rays. When the rays of light come out from the light source, they're going to hit the object at different angles. OK? Uh, and this is going to have a big effect on the shading of the object. It's going to have an effect on the shading of this object versus just underneath the lamp. And it's going to have an effect on the shadow cast by the massive grapefruit next to the river. Um, Examples of local light sources. Well, a local light source is um, effectively any kind of artificial kind of light source. Any kind of human-made light source tends to be uh, a local light source. We have yet to manage to make uh, a light source that, is, that feels like it's infinitely far away and casts hard, sharp kind of shadows. So think about um, yeah, sort of artificial kind of light. So examples would be uh, computer monitors, uh, the aforementioned um, lamp, street lamp, like a bulb, just a normal kind of light bulb, like a projector that's projecting onto the, um, the screen. So that would be a local light source. So they're mostly, uh, the virtually, in fact, virtually all, all artificial light sources are local light sources. I'm just going to say that now. There are some cases where... Um, things in nature can be local light sources as well. Even though you could say maybe a candle is an artificial light source because it's fire tamed by humans, so to speak. Uh, fire itself, I guess, is kind of natural. But like a fire, like a naturally occurring fire, um, like a bonfire, well, not a bonfire, if something was set on fire, like a forest fire, that's a local light source. It's a big local light source, but it's a local light source. Other things would be lightning as well. Um, that would be a local light source because if you look at pictures of lightning and have managed to you know the, the photographers managed to capture an image of it um, near something else you'll see the shadow kind of radiate out from it and that's another key thing to think about is what happens to the shadow not just the fact that the local the light source that's local only has an a, effect on the immediate vicinity it's black in the background here this um, street light fades off quite quickly these monitors fade off quite quickly let's have a look in CG what a local light source is. So here I've got the same, exactly the same cylinder sitting on exactly the same kind of plane. 
Uh, but I put a little logo just here, a little icon, where the light source was casting. And this time, this plane, well, it's unevenly lit. It's brightest where the light source is, and it fades off the further it gets away from the light source, behind the light source, because what you can't see here, this is a, a light source that's pointing in one direction. Behind the light source, nothing's lit, or it's lit by some just some ambient light. But more importantly, look what's happening to the shadows. Compared to the direct light source, whose shadows were parallel, the shadows of the local light source kind of fan out from it. They, as I said, they radiate out from it like that. That is a key thing to bear in mind. Maybe it's less to bear in mind if you are a VFX CGI person or you're working on uh, a game level. If you're a concept artist though, and maybe you're doing painting and you're doing pure digital painting, then you really do have to bear this in mind. CGI person, level designer, they're going to kind of get this for free. If they load in, if they create like a point light or a spotlight or anything on a light like that, they're going to get uh, a light that behaves like that. But if you're painting something from scratch and you mean it to be the sun or the moon, but you paint the shadows like that, it's going to be wrong. And you will probably sense that there's something not quite right about it. And the viewer will probably sense that. Maybe the viewer won't be able to know what's wrong with it, but they'll know it. They'll feel it. Okay. So bear that in mind. Direct light sources ca uh, cast parallel shadows and things are evenly lit unless they are directly in shadow. Local light sources fade off quite quickly. Light fades off very, very quick. Um, much quicker than you think it does. Again, if you're a concept artist and you're painting stuff like a, a geezer holding a torch or something like that, I bet you that you're going to paint way too much glow. You're going to have the light from that torch illuminating all of your warrior or your explorer or adventurer. When in real life, even though you might not be wanting to totally recreate real life, but if you want to paint light believably, that light has much, much less effect than you think it does. But because the local light source fades off super quick and the shadows radiate out from the thing casting the shadow. Okay? So that is a direct light source versus a local light source. And they're the differences between the two. I think it's important to know that kind of stuff. It's easy, easy to remember. Let's talk about, though, the, if, how we can break down, or how we can describe how objects are actually lit and shaded. This becomes, again, well, I think concept artists have it the hardest, because if they insist on painting everything from scratch, then they're going to definitely have to know every single last bit of this. The more digital you get, the less you have to maybe worry about technically recreating it. But again, um, artistically, you're going to have to still know it. It's called light terminology. So if an object is even remotely curved, or has that kind of curved surface, or has any part of it that's kind of curved, which, let's face it, are nearly all objects have some kind of curvature going on it, then the way that the light and shadow plays across that object can be broken down. You can describe the different characteristics of that lit curved object. Let's show you what I mean here. So I've taken exactly the same scene, the same light even. I've just swapped it out, swapped out a cylinder for a sphere, just because you can't get more curved than a perfect sphere. And let's look at the different parts, because they all have different names here. Now, I don't want you to get hung up by, you don't need to know the names of these things, because depending whether you're a digital artist, CG person, graphic designer, photographer, you're going to have a slightly different name for each one of these things. But um, all of you across those disciplines, you will have these different parts. It's, I don't know why no one has said, hey, you know, let's all call them exactly the same things. Um, maybe it's because it doesn't really matter. As long as you know what you mean when you're talking about it, that's all that matters. So I'm going to describe and break down what these different bits are. So we've got a light source here lighting a perfectly spherical object, this big sphere. But maybe the most important part is this thing here that I've chosen to call the passive highlight. You might just call it, well, that's just the lit side of the object. And that's totally fine to call it that. Because that's all the passive highlight is. It's the broad lit side of the object facing the light source. Maybe it's the most important bit in some ways. The next thing we've got here 
is called the active highlight. So here we've got a passive highlight and an act active highlight. Now what you might actually think, if you've uh, been doing a bit of CG, we've got a bit of CG background, ah, oh, I think I know what he means here. What, I, what he calls the active highlight, I would call the specular highlight. And all that really is, is the reflection of the light source. And that's actually another thing to technically bear in mind. I'm calling these highlights. Um, these are just reflections. Everything to do with light is reflected. It doesn't matter whether it's reflected in the way that you think of, say, a mirror. You think that's the ultimate reflective thing. Or it's something like this carpet that doesn't really look reflective at all. It is reflective, because if it wasn't reflective, you wouldn't see it. That's all that reflection is. It's light bouncing and reflecting off of things. And all the specular highlight is, is a focused, sharp highlight, or a sharp reflection. And a passive highlight, or a passive reflection, is a diffused reflection. It's where the light beams have come in, hit it, and instead of the light rays bouncing in a concentrated, focused way back, they're hitting it and they're scattering as they bounce off. So it's almost like a blurry. All that lit side is, in some ways, is just a super, super blurry reflection of the highlight. So if you can conceptually get that in your head, that that's all that's happening around you. Every single object is reflective. All that really matters is how rough the object is. If the object isn't rough at all, it's like a mirror and it's got a sharp focus reflection. If it's very rough, like a carpet, like cloth, like sand maybe, well that's maybe a slightly different one, like dust, uh, then it's a very diffused, rough kind of reflection. That's passive um, and active highlight. Then you've got this thing here called the core shadow. Now the core shadow, even though it's not at the part of the object that's facing directly away from the light, weirdly, in some ways counterintuitively, the core shadow is going to be almost the darkest part of the object that you can actually visibly see. It's going to be this almost this kind of dark line that's the border between the lit side and the side that's in shadow. We call that the core shadow. If you were uh, an astronomer, you'd call that the terminator, because that's what they call that. That's the dark line between day and night. But the core shadow is often the darkest part of the object. This is going to come in super um, important later when we're doing um, when we're lighting people. I'm going to jump to the car shadow. Car shadow is probably the most obvious kind of bit. That's just simply the the shadow cast by the object that's lit by this light. This is a local light source, so the shadow kind of stretches and fans out away from the sphere. If this was lit by a direct light source, the shadow would be a long, thin strip instead. Also, if it was a direct light source, it would probably be a sharper kind of shadow as well, because that's another byproduct of things being lit by the sun. They tend to have a much crisper, sharper shadow. They will be soft to a certain extent, but not so much as light lit by um, a local light source. So the car shadow is pretty easy to understand. Then we've got this thing called the occlusion shadow. This is a bit trickier in some ways. This is simply bits of a surface that are the most occluded from all light. So the where the floor meets the underside of the um, sphere, that's in the most that's in the, the the most sort of nook and cranny, the most crevicey part of the scene. The light from our direct light source can't really get to it. But even the sort of ambient light, there is like a sort of a very, very low intensity ambient light in the scene. That has trouble getting to it. You know, it bounces here all onto the surface, but when it gets to the underside here, you know, it is, it's difficult to get in there. You can see this when you look at um, the world around you, when you look at where ceilings meet walls. You will see it gets a little bit darker where a ceiling meets a wall. Even though you couldn't really say that it was being cast in shadow, it's simply that the angles between those two surfaces become more acute, and so light has trouble bouncing into there and reaching into there. So it's imperceptibly, well not imperceptibly, it's subtly darker. And then lights get, the occlusion gets even more noticeable at the corner. So when you see a seat, when you see two walls and a ceiling or a floor meet, and you look at the corner, that's going to be the darkest kind of point as well. That's an occlusion shadow. Occlusion shadows are really important for us um, to make things feel like they're grounded and they're, um, they're, there's two things are plausibly sitting next to each other or pushed up against next to each other. If I did this um, sphere 
but I didn't have the occlusion shadow, but I did have the cast shadow. Yeah, you would sort of buy it. You would believe that that ball was sat on the floor. But that occlusion, just here, is what in some ways really sells that it's, it's sat on this kind of gray floor. Um, again, if you're doing CG, if you're doing CGI and VFX, you're kind of going to get that for free these days. Back in the old days, you didn't. You had to fake it. You had to make it yourself. But if you're a concept artist, you and you're maybe not using any CG, maybe you're photo bashing. Maybe you're just traditionally digitally kind of painting. If you forget about things like the occlusion, then you might wonder, well, how come my tree doesn't look like it's really sitting on the ground, you know, grown up out of the ground? Or how come my, my rocky kind of boulder just doesn't feel as solid as enough? It's because you haven't painted a little bit of occlusion, a little bit of tiny subtle occlusion between the ground and where the boulder are on the ground. So yeah, that's the occlusion shadow. The last thing to bear in mind here is this thing called the reflected or bounce light. So if I zoom in on this, because this is probably most subtle. Reflected bounce light, well it's just, it, well, <laughs> that's handy isn't it? Um, reflected bounce light is just the behavior of normal light. All light bounces. Whereas occlusion light is the absence of light being able to bounce into those nooks and crannies. Reflected bounce light is the fact that the light is hitting this bright bit of the floor and it's immediately bouncing and hitting the underside of this sphere. So it's a little bit lighter on the underside, just here. Um, bounce light is subtle, or it's normally quite subtle, or you should, you should know that it's normally quite subtle and know when to push it to gain a certain effect. But again, if you don't know that light is subtle and you don't know why your things look unnatural, it's because you don't quite understand it. Light loses a lot of energy, so it bounces around infinitely, um, or effectively infinitely. It bounces off here and then bounces again, 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 over and over and over and over and over again. Um, but it loses a ton of energy off of that first bounce. So it could be super bright here, boom, and it's lost. Well, it's, you take the intensity of the light, and if you do some maths, you um, do the uh, inverse square calculation on it, on its intensity, and that's the new value of that first bounce of light. So it's hardly anything. But you notice it does mean that the underside of this sphere, even though it can't see the ambient skylight, is slightly lit. Or again, let's go back to the idea that it's reflected. All that's really happening is some of it it's reflecting some of the brighter light near it. Okay, so these are different parts of, of the light. So if you light an object in such a way that you can see all of these components see that 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 all of them then what you're doing is you're maximizing the 3d representation of the thing that you're drawing or you're lighting and rendering or um, you're showing off in your game level you're getting that 100 percent feeling of that's a real physical 3d ball i can i can sense that you know it doesn't feel flat um when we shade and light um, objects in this kind of way um, there's actually a kind of term for it, it's an Italian term, uh, called uh, chiaroscuro, which is kind of means essentially the sort of play of light and shadow, light and dark. There are distinct contrasts between the lit side of something and the unlit side of something. So if you miss any of these elements out, then you're going to slightly take away some of that sense of 3D form. And sometimes you want that to happen. And that's great, that's cool. But if your stuff is looks as I mentioned a bit earlier, if your stuff is looking a bit flat, and this again is mostly happening with people who are uh, painting something from scratch, it's because you don't really understand what's going on with the light and shade. And you've missed something out because you didn't know about it, you didn't uh, understand it properly. Uh, having said that, you can overlight stuff in CG, and we'll see later how if you overdo everything, then. Um, you'll have a similar problem. You'll get a very flat kind of looking image. But as I said, sometimes you want that flat look, and that's great, but know that you want that flat look. Right, okay, that was a chunky bit of theory there. Um, we're gonna go into some more practical kind of stuff now. So, in Maya, if you wanna open up uh, that three-point lighting scene, What you've got in here 
is a um, little model with a cool samurai sword that I forgot to take out, but what the hey. Um, so this is a model actually from uh, a Daz scene file. If you don't know Daz, um, Daz, is also, Daz is my mate, Darren Cullis, but Daz is also um, uh, a 3D program uh, that's all about, <laughs> well, it's about a lot of things. Some of them pretty dodgy, but it's really useful for concept artists because it's essentially a uh, 3D program that's got preset human figures. And um, it's free, which is really useful. And it's r they're all rigged. So you can rig them in DAS, or you can just export them to Maya, and you can rig them in Maya if you want to, or Max or Blender or whatever. Uh, so this is a DAS kind of model. Uh, DAS, as I mentioned, DAS is super good because it's free, and you don't have to pay anything. And um, but if you do want to pay stuff, you can sort of buy different outfits and clothes for your models and stuff. It's like digital dollies, really, that kind of thing. Um, but what would happen if adults got in charge of digital dollies? But um, I'll let you find that out later, and I'll take no responsibility for what you find. Um, but it is uh, very useful for concept artists. So this is a DAS model, and I just stuck a uh, grey uh, Arnold, and Arnold is the renderer, the default renderer of uh, Maya, onto this. We're going to use this for three-point lighting. So what is three-point lighting? Um, it's maybe one of the oldest, um, but still maybe the most relevant way of lighting, uh, particularly a character um, kind of thing. And it comes from photography and cinema. And it's designed to accentuate the form of something. So in some ways, it's designed to do this with just three lights. This is obviously lit with just one light. So you can get all this with one light, but three-point lighting is going to give us more control. You essentially, and this is how I want you to approach lighting, and I'm telling you that if you start approaching lighting this way, um, I can speak obviously for my concept art students and my CGI students, although I don't really teach the CGI students um, lighting um, for C intro to CGI, but I can speak for my concept art a lot, that um, this is how I want you to light from now on, <laughs> and if I see otherwise, I'll get super peed off. Um, you light slowly. Even though lighting is quick, and it's much quicker than modelling, you, you don't try and rush it. You, you take your time with it, and you do it one thing at a time. Uh, and the way I would recommend doing this, and you can always break rules once you know them, is you tackle it in order. Key light, fill light, and rim light. So just three lights, and, and these are the, the names of them. And these are area lights, and we're going to talk a little bit about area lights uh, in a moment after this. You notice the different sizes and this is going to um, make a difference as well. So the key light, so normally you start with the key light. So if you've not used Maya before, for the people who haven't used Maya, um, you pro if the people who haven't used Maya, they've probably used Max. So it's similar in a way, except you hold down Alt. Alt and left mouse button lets you tumble around. Alt and middle mouse button, keep it held down, the mouse wheel, lets you kind of track around. And Alt, right mouse button, that you move in and out. And you select objects by, either, by clicking on them in the viewport or clicking on them in the outliner just here. And on the other side, you've got this thing called the attribute editor. So as I select each one of these lights, you can see that the exposure is changing on each one. I've done some preset values into here. And if I want to move an object in Maya, I select it and tap W. If I want to rotate it, I tap E. And if I want to scale it, I tap R. So E, W, E, R, they're all next to each other on the keyboard, so it's fairly easy to remember. W, E, R. So I'm going to start one light at a time. What I've got set up here, this is my camera point of view. And I've also got a little bookmark, because Maya, for reasons that I have no idea why they chose to do this, um, undo doesn't work if you change the camera in Maya. You can make it so undo will work, but uh, by default it doesn't. It isn't like that. So a bookmark, if you accidentally go, oops, uh-oh, how do I get back to there? You go to view, bookmarks, three-point lighting. Well, I'll take you back. All right, this is a very, very quick intro to Maya. Three-point lighting then. So we want to light this character so that we can see them, we show it off in the best, most aesthetically pleasing way. We're going to start off with the key light. We're not going to bother. Don't even think about start moving these yet, OK? Key light first. It's the smallest light. So we're going to lift it up, and we're going to move it around, and you can begin to see that it's got an effect in the viewport. 
in Maya, just use this as a general guide. The actual illumination, the brightness, is going to be different when we render it. So we want to move this around. Now, key lights, in general, but not always, tend to be to one side and a little bit high up, pointing down. Imagine them as being they're the most important light because they're going to be they're going to decide what the main shadows are doing and whether the light's going to be lit from that side or this side, from below or from below or side this side. So you want to position it, the little arrow sticking out, it's not an arrow, a little line sticking out of the uh, light shows you the direction it's facing. So we're going to move it around. You can see how it plays around like this. So I'm not bothering with that fill light at the moment or that rim light. I just want to decide how I'm going to light this. And one of the key giveaways, um, a really handy feature on the human face, by the way, if you tap space when you're hovering over a viewport, you maximize it. I'm looking for the shadow cast by the nose. That's what I'm looking at. That shadow cast by the nose can really change the feel of your um, lighting. And it can be flattering or it can be unflattering. Uh, you can very quickly turn your models into little mini Hitlers by doing that. Having the light like this. You've got a little Hitler moustache going on there, right? Now, again, if you want that to happen, fair enough. Most people don't want that to happen, unless they're Nazis, but um, I'd hope there are no Nazis here. Uh, so look to see what's happening to the shadow on the nose. It's a good giveaway. So I'm going to roughly position this. And I'm going to, to make moving, it's a bit difficult, isn't it? Moving this light up and down and then rotating it. A nicer way of doing this is have the light selected. And in this viewport, go to panels, look through selected. Suddenly you get this, whoa, this crazy kind of wide angle kind of view of your character. But now essentially um, it's made the camera in this viewport the light. So I can rotate and move around as if it were a camera. You can see how the light's changing position. It's just a little bit more of an intuitive way of positioning a light. So I'm going to take this slow. Okay, I make no apologies for this. I'm not going to go fast. So I want my light to be casting a shadow that's a little bit up and to the side. And I don't want really I don't really want the shadow of the nose to make a little Hitler tash. So I'm going to position it to the side. I don't want it's a local light source I'm simulating here. So I don't want necessarily both of these eyes to be exactly the same illumination. I'm quite happy with one side of the face to be a little bit more brightly lit than the other. And we get in this what core shadow here happening down here, which I think is quite pleasing. Okay, so I'm going to position it like this. And as I mentioned, um, you get an idea of what it's going to look like, but you don't get um, a properly accurate idea. You're going to have to actually render this to see it. So if you want to render it, uh, you have to make sure that you've got this viewport selected just by clicking on it. And even then it might not work, you might have to change it. And go to Arnold, Arnold, open render view, and hit the little play button. And you get instant little render, okay? So I'm quite happy with that. I could fiddle around though, and I could tweak it till kingdom come, and I'd be quite happy. I'd be having a good time. You'd get no complaints from me. Um, it's relatively quick to interact and update, so you can sort of continue to further tweak the position of the light and watch it update. Notice that these are local light sources. So if I, if I move away, the light's going to get dimmer. If it were a direct light source, there would be no change in illumination because it doesn't matter where the direct light source is. So when I'm happy with my key light, and I'm quite happy with that key light, only then do I continue with my fill light. So I'm going to stop that rendering. I'm going to make sure that I switch back to uh, perspective one here. That's how you choose your cameras up here. I should have got rid of the um, sort of defunct. I don't know. I've only got, I should have named these, but ideally, perspective one is what we're looking at through here. Perspective, sorry, perspective is what we're looking at through this one. Our camera view. And perspective one is kind of like our working kind of view. Okay, so now that I've done my key light, 
I'm going to do my fill light. Notice as well that my fill light is a lot bigger in size than the key light. What's a fill light for? Well, at the moment, when I render, uh, the key light lights this side of the face, but the side that's um, not facing the key light is in complete shadow. You can't see anything at all because I haven't got any ambient light. This guy's not outside. There's no light from the sky hitting him at all, you know? So it's completely pitch black. So the fill light is a way of you to be able to control just how dark the darkest side of your object is going to be. Okay, and it tends to be a big light because the smaller your light is, the sharper and crisper your shadows are going to be. The bigger your light is, the softer and fuzzier and more indistinct your shadows are going to be. Again, we're going to load up that area light scene in a bit, and we'll see that in action a little bit, um, bit more obviously than here. So I'm going to move my fill light up, and I'm going to position it. The fill light typically, but not always, goes on the opposite side of the camera to where the key light is. So here's our camera. This is our camera here. This is what we're looking through. Key light's on one side. If you imagine a straight line, if I just zoom, go straight over the top, imagine a line shooting up in this direction. On one side is my key light. Typically, typically the key light goes on the opposite side. And normally, usually, but not always, a little bit further down, maybe a bit tilted up. And you want to move this further away or closer for now. We're not going to change the actual brightness. We're going to control this just by moving it. And that's going to decide how dark this actually gets. So again, looks all right in the viewport, but let's check it actually in the render. Okay, hard to see on the um, projector because it's very, very subtle at the moment. So let's move this key light in and hope that Arnold doesn't crash. So as I move it further in, it's getting a bit brighter. A bit brighter still. So now it's not getting completely black. You know what? I'm just going to stop and pause that because I'm always worried that it's going to crash. Because um, Maya is just so prone to crashing, as a lot of you probably have already found out. I'm going to change my movement method here to object so that I can literally just pull, pull this in and out a bit easier. I'm going to lift it up a little bit to the face and rotate it a little bit more parallel. If you've done any, if any of you, I know one person here at least because I just know him, <laughs> has already, is already doing a bit of photography. So if you're a photographer, hopefully this stuff is like um, very familiar to you. So there we are. So I'm going to move this in a little bit further. So now the shadows on this side, well, they're not completely black. Still got this real nice sense of form. Still got a core shadow going on here. And that core shadow is still technically or perceptually the darkest thing in there. You can also begin to see occlusion. So if I zoom in, all this stuff around the ears, that's occlusion shadow. Okay, That's where the light from the key light and the light from the fill light can't actually reach. So I'm going to mess around with that. Now on the projector, I'm going to over-egg it a little bit just because the projector is not very good at contrast. So let's say that that was my desired level of fill light. We can just briefly show you. So I'm going to put, um, save a screenshot. I'm just going to put this down to zero. That's without fill light. And that's with fill light. Okay. And I get to decide with a fill light exactly how dark it's going to be. Not leaving anything to chance. Not hoping for a happy accident in this case. I want to be in control and you should want to be in control as well. Okay. So that's the fill light. And again, only when I'm happy with the positioning of that am I going to move on to the last one, which is the rim light. Sometimes it's called a rim light. Sometimes they call it a kicker. Sometimes they call it a highlight. Um, sometimes other lights will be called, called these things. They all serve a similar kind of function. Whoops, I'm still rendering, so I'll need to bring back... Maya to stop it from rendering otherwise I run the risk of a crash and it goes slow. So where does the rim light go? The rim light's function is to separate your subject from the background. At the moment 
this guy is just against a black background. Now you can see him, yeah, because there is nothing in the background, but we want to separate him a bit more. The rim light, in some ways, is maybe the most arty kind of light. It's also the one to be used with the most amount of care. What it's going to do is going to almost give us a graphical line that's going to pull him from the background. So it's going to go behind your object. You've got to use it with caution. In the viewport, you can see what it's doing. So if I just temporarily hide lights in the viewport, you can see what this is doing here. Just pulling the back of him, we're getting lit. It doesn't go to complete black. It goes to our de desired level, and the fill light helped us get there. And then we're getting this little thin graphic strip of light right on the back that's pulling him from the background. Now, again, in a moment, we're going to do an exercise where we recreate light from films. And once you start looking at films, once you really start looking at films, you don't just consume the film, because I hope none of you are just consumers. You should all be makers. Once you start really looking at films, you're going to see these rim lights are everywhere. They're, they're so important, because um, with film, you need to get a read on the, on the film image straight away. You can't... if the foreground is kind of messily blending in with the background, it's difficult to see it. So a rim light will extract and pull that subject away from the background. So I'm going to position my rim light, and the rim light normally goes directly behind, and it tends to be quite bright. But again, Maya's going to give me an incorrect feeling for what the rim light's doing here. Let's see what it actually looks like. Yeah, see, Maya looks all right. Looks like a little thin strip of light. But when you actually render it, because um, Arnold can read it, the fact that it's a render light, uh, an area light, sorry. There's too much of it going on just here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to further push it behind this guy until I can barely see it in the viewport. That's more like it. But even then, it's still a bit too much for my taste. So I'm going to move it a bit more, probably move it a bit down a bit as well. doing this annoying thing where it minimizes it. That's what I'm looking for, this kind of effect. And this, I might actually bring down the intensity a little bit. We've got this, uh, again, if you're not used to using Arnold and Meyer, um, in the attribute editor here, you've got intensity and exposure. Leave intensity at one for now and just change the exposure. So I've got it at 13. The reason I like exposure, because it mimics how film works and we're trying to recreate how film is looking here. So you might as well go all in and just behave like a film person. So I'm going to lower this down to 10. So I've got much less of a rim light. Don't need that much. And again, when you look at film, sometimes you'll see really over the top rim lights, but a lot of the time you'll see the barest subtle hint of a rim light. Now, I've got this three point lighting set up. So I'm looking at it all now and I'm thinking I'm quite liking it, but I'm going to up the intensity of the fill light a little bit, just so it shows up a bit more on the projector. So let's try 11. Let's go even higher, let's try 12. Let's bump up to 14. It's not having much effect here, is it? Oh, I know why, yeah, because I've set the intensity down to uh, uh, 1. This is going to be too bright now. Whoa, too bright. That shows up pretty well on the monitor, I think, on the projector. So you've got a key light, one light, fill light, rim light. So what I want you to do, um, if you haven't been doing it as you've been following along, is to have a go yourself, right? Position it, these lights, first of all in this way, but then switch it around. Swap the whole thing around. Light from the other direction and see how it makes it look different. What you're looking to do with this three-point lighting is to accentuate the, three, uh, the 3D form of the figure. Think as if you were a photographer trying to make this person look good, okay? And I'm going to get a drink because uh, I've been talking for over an hour and I'm absolutely parched. Now, if anyone's having any trouble with Maya, um, let me know if you're new to it and it's not behaving properly. Right. <clears throat> we're going to do a bit more of this in a moment, but we're going to do a bit more of this in terms of film lighting, and we're going to study some stuff. I want to go back, though, now 
and just briefly talk about area lights and how important they are. Uh, so there's another scene, that other scene called uh, area lights. Load that one up. Now I'm a big um, proponent of area lights when you're doing CG stuff, especially if you're doing it if you're doing it in Maya. Less so. If, I think it's more difficult if you're a games person. I'll, I'll see that. Uh, because there are certain conditions where you've got to bake light and calculate lights and, and things are a bit tougher. But when it comes to CG and concept art, uh, I would always use area lights where I can. I'd only use a different kind of type of light if I really need to get some very specific thing. Because area lights best mimic how real lights work. Uh, let me just show you actually on Photoshop. So what is an area light versus what are lights? The, um, how do the lights used to be in CG? So... Back in the dark old days, when I was um, starting to do this kind of thing, when you created a light, a little point light source, or a spotlight, let's draw um, that grapefruit again. Um, and you made a light, you made a point light or a spotlight, something like that. What was happening was, that light was actually coming from an infinitely small point in space okay it was coming from no area no volume no kind of size it would fire out a ton of rays from this tiny tiny pinprick point so the rays of light would go from here like this the end result was that the shadow that you got was super super crisp and sharp because whether that was a shadow or not was dependent just on one one ray hitting it from that tiny little point. It would come through here, it would go, oh, I've been blocked by the grapefruit. So that's where the shadow would be on that particular pixel. It would come from this one tiny spot. So all these angles coming from one infinitely small spot. Didn't matter whether it was uh, a spotlight. So if it was a spotlight, it would sort of be coming in a direction like that. Or if it was a kind of point light source, it would be doing the same thing, but coming from all directions. This meant that you got extremely sharp, crisp shadows. And it also meant that the shading um, tended to look very harsh all the time. Everything looked like it was, by default, looked like it was lit from, um, imagine a very, very small, tiny little pocket pen torch. How harsh that light looks. It doesn't look very soft, does it? It casts shadows that are very crisp and dark and sharp. So area light better, um, better mimics how light really kind of works. So um, here's the grapefruit again. An area light doesn't come from a single infinitely small tiny spot. It comes from an area. Now by default in Maya and Arnold, that area is a rectangle but it can be uh, a disc and it can also be um, a cylinder as well. And in certain 3D applications and renderers like um, Redshift, it can be a sphere as well. So an area light source, as the name suggests, is emitted from an area, it's not emitted from a single spot. And so a spot here, a ray of light here, can come in like that way but a spot up here comes from a slightly different kind of angle. And bits like this, this kind of thing can begin to happen. Means that whether something's in and out or out of shadow depends on what part of the area of light. It's almost like, imagine it instead of, um, in fact this is how we used to simulate it when we couldn't have area lights. We would instead of relying on just one pinpoint light source, we would make little arrays of light source. So imagine this area is actually lots and lots of little light sources. And every single one of them can cast a shadow. And they will get smushed and blended together in the renderer. And that is what gives you um, that soft kind of shadow. Let's look at it actually in action. So this is just our sphere with our um, area light source. And it's a very, very small area light source, which means that the shadows coming from it 
are quite crisp and sharp because it's getting closer and closer to that sort of that idea of coming from an infinitely small spot. Now you can't make it come from an infinitely small spot with an area light, and why would you want to? If you really, really wanted that, you could just go in and use one of Maya's um, traditional kind of point light sources. But because it's coming from a small spot, the light looks really harsh, doesn't it? And it's a harsh shadow. What happens when we scale that area up? Like this. We're not going to change any of the intensities of the light at all. We're just going to make that light source bigger. I'm going to take a little screenshot of that. Get that instead. So two main things have happened. Just let it render out. That'll do. Two main things have happened. One, the light on the surface is much, much softer. And likewise, the shadow being cast. We haven't changed the position of this area of light. We haven't rotated it. We haven't changed the intensity of it. But now the shadow is way softer and fuzzier. It's almost beginning to look like a, an occlusion kind of shadow. That's what it was before. That's what it is now. No change of intensity or brightness. Also, not is the light softer on the side facing the area of light. That core shadow is softer as well. That's because the light is literally beginning to wrap around the sides of the sphere. It's a, literally a bigger area. So um, I'm just going to make sure that I've got, got a bookmark set up here. So if I look at it now like this, you can see that light's going to be casting out from this big area and it's going to be it's going to be able to this side of the sphere can see it a little bit so the light actually begins to wrap around the object whereas if the area of light's really little can't see the area of light anymore so the light is not going to wrap around or not as much the bigger you make that area of light the more the light's going to wrap around and it is super important to bear in mind um, when you're trying to make stuff look nice and appealing. Again, going back to the photographer's analogy, if you ever have family photos done, um, I can't stand those family photos personally where you all sit in a white studio and like the littlest kid holds like a teddy bear or something like that and everyone puts a fixed smile on their face. Um, I, just, I can't stand it. Uh, but remember what the lights look like, a professional photographer's lights. He, now, he or she has either got a light with a massive umbrella, which is like a reflector, which is going to kind of bounce the light. The light's actually not facing you, it's facing the umbrella. And it scatters around and bounces off the umbrella back into the scene. If he's not doing that, or she's not doing that, she's going to have these big area lights with what they call big diffusers. And they're often just made of tissue paper, or it's something a bit like tissue paper. The whole point of that is to soften the light. And because you've got soft light is more flattering because the shadows become softer. When we did these guys just here, that danger of getting the Hitler moustache is because you've got this big crisp sharp shadow. The key light that we were using was really small so the shadows were quite crisp and so you're going to maximize what we I mentioned that earlier, that Kia Securo effect I don't know, I'm probably not saying that right. Um, you're going to maximise that effect where you can see light, shadow, light, shadow, light, shadow. And it's going to show every single um, nook and cranny, every single imperfection on your face, your knobbly nose, your oversized mouth, every last bit of you that you, you sort of wince at when you get, when you get photographed. You're going to maximise that when you've got harsh, um, small kind of light sources. But if you have a big light source... Um, the shadows are going to be so soft and indistinct and the light's going to evenly wrap around you that um, you're not going to see that as much. So it's going to look a lot more flattering. So when you're trying to light something to make it look dreamy and nice and appealing and not dramatic and scary and like this guy's being um, interrogated or something like that, bear that in mind. Maybe you need a bigger light source. Now, if you're doing something purely in CG, then happy days. You just need to increase the size of the light source. If you're painting it, traditionally, uh, you have to paint that soft kind of light. It's, well, you should be practicing painting anyway, obviously. If that's what you're doing, you should be practicing that all the time for fun. Um, 
But when you want to get an effect and you want something to look more fantasy like, more fairy tale like, um, maybe your shadows are too sharp. Maybe your shadows are too crisp. Maybe the um, that Kiyosakuro effect is too much. Maybe you need the light wrapping around. You're going to lose some of that 3D-ness. Things are going to look a little bit flatter, but you want that to be happening because you want that effect. It's, again, it's all about intent, right? Don't leave... When you do, if you're a concept artist and you're doing thumbnailing, then yeah, a little bit of happy accident's great. But when you're getting into the nitty gritty of doing a finished piece of work and you want something to look a certain way, you have to know what you want to do and you have to know how to do it. And then if it goes wrong, you have to be able to troubleshoot it. And lighting is normally going to go wrong because of your lighting. So that's an area light. So just load that area light up. Just experiment with um, making it bigger, smaller. See how big you can make it. See how extreme you can get that effect. Maybe move the light around. One other thing I should just mention on Arnold, which is um, kind of Arnold Meyer spe uh, specific. Let's turn this off. It's still rendering at the moment. So you can see here that this is a, an area light with a little line coming out showing the direction it's pointing. But if you look at the render, you can actually see that there's light coming out um, sort of perpendicular to the light's direction. This is because by default, lights in Arnold have this spread value set to one which means that um, it almost acts like a spotlight with a very, very wide kind of cone of light. So the light coming from the center is coming out straight like that. But then as we get towards the edges, it begins to sort of, um, again, I'm using the words radiate out, fan out a lot. That's what's happening to it. But if you change this spread value uh, down to a lower number, like 0.1 maybe, you're gonna get that effect. So the light is not gonna spread out. Notice it gets a lot noisier as well. That's a side effect of Arnold and Meyer. And it looks a lot less intense on the ground. It doesn't look any less intense on the thing that it's illuminating here. But you begin to get slightly funky results where the light is intersecting with stuff. So bear that in mind. But this is why area lights are awesome, and I would use them more than I would use spotlights, is that they function both as, um, as a sort of like a point light source, and they also function as a um, sort of spotlight, a focused beam of light as well. So just have a fiddle with that, play around with changing the size and changing the spread, while I also mention just a couple of other things about them. I mentioned that by default, uh, area light sources come in as this quad, or this rectangular kind of shape. Now Maya, um, and to be honest, any other renderer, you're going to get more than one flavour. Um, in Maya, you get three flavours. Quad, cylinder, and disc. I'm going to skip cylinder for now. Disc, well, that's exactly how you would imagine it to be. It's just a disc shape. It's going to have a slightly different feel to it. Um, but then you've also got this one called cylinder. Whereas quad and disc are flat 2D shapes, cylinder is now an actual 3D shape. So it's going to cast light from all directions around the radius, but not, importantly, and maybe frustratingly, from the kind of poles. Although you do get this awesome black hole kind of effect. Again, it's going to have a different kind of effect on the lighting. Play around with it. 99% um, of the time, you're good with quad. Um, now, concept artists and CGI people from level 4 recently finished their um, intro to CGI uh, assignment when they were doing Mars based interiors and obviously um, there's a lot of artificial light sources in there and quite a few people have had things like fluorescent light strips you know and that's a very common thing to have and you might be tempted to think well cylinder literally looks a bit like a fluorescent light strip why not just use that isn't that the best choice for a fluorescent light strip mm, maybe sometimes but um, not all the time. In fact, most of the time, not. It's inefficient. Uh, if you look at the... I mean, you can't see the fluorescent light strips in these fixtures overhead. Uh, yes, they are cylinders. Yes, they're casting light from all directions. But they're in reflector housings that push all of that light downwards. And so the end result of the light coming from these, these light fixtures is as if there were a rectangular light pointing down with some spread going on. 
it's much more efficient to do it that way rather than have a bunch of cylindrical um, area lights scaled up and sized up and put where the lights should be. You've got this thing called samples, which is the quality essentially of the shadow. Uh, and that's going to be calculated all the way around it. Um, the lower that number, at one is the default, the grainier um, this light source is. And if that number goes up, the smoother this gets. Uh, but, it's, but if you do it on a cylinder, it's going to have to, it's going to take, um, you put this number higher, it's going to have to calculate it all the way around. And you're not going to see half of the entire illumination of this if you were to mimic and fake a kind of um, fluorescent light sort of setup you're not going to see it, it's pointless. So you're going to be adding to render time and you're going to be adding to all manner of other things like, well, if I've, I can't notice how you can't see the light source. You can only see what the light source is illuminating, not the light source itself. Well, that means then, uh, well, I've got to have a model for the fluorescent light bulb itself, uh, but it's in exactly the same spot as the light. So if I just put the light inside it, now I'm not going to see anything because now suddenly my model is actually casting shadows from it. So I've got to go in, I've got to tweak the settings to make it so... My fluorescent light model doesn't cast shadows and so that the light can actually go through it and it's just a headache. Instead, um, if you're doing those kind of light fixtures, just have an aerial light over the top. This is for special, special, special cases where you literally would be able to see all the way around it. Maybe a lightsaber, something like that. We'll just have a little play with that. <clears throat> Get comfortable with it. Know that you're in control. Got to, you've got to know that you're in control of it. And we're not even going to look at mesh lights. Mesh lights are, um, I think, as you haven't earned the right to use mesh lights yet. <laughs> Get really, really good at lighting stuff like this, and then you can use mesh lights. Uh, if you don't know what a mesh light is, um, you can, um, in Maya and Arnold, and in, to be honest, in virtual renderers, you can actually make any object, any 3D object, you can turn it into a light. But that comes with a whole other. A uh, bunch of problems, and again, they should only be used when you've achieved. They're like the new game plus of lights. Okay. So everyone's a whiz on aerial lights now. Everyone is totally comfortable and um, knows exactly how aerial lights illuminate stuff and their different behavioral characteristics, which is great, because you're going to need it. Let's go back to that three-point lighting. Right. Now we're getting into the um, we're getting into the if you only take one thing away from this lecture, this is what you need to take away. So um, pay attention on this bit. This is a way of you practicing and getting better at lighting. This is lighting from reference. Uh, so if you're a painter, way back in the olden days as well, and if, even now, and I still encourage people to do it. One of the ways you learn is that you do a copy of an existing painting. They would call them, in painting, master studies. And if you were an apprentice artist, you would paint a picture of your master's artwork, or um, your, your, uh, your master artist would say, no, have a look at this picture that Rembrandt did. Now you do your version. 
And the reason you do that and why it's so useful is because it slows you down. You are forced to study a bit of art that is awesome. You are forced to analyze it and try and figure out how that effect, how certain effects in the painting were achieved. You have to look at the brush strokes. And so you learn, oh, what's the most efficient, nicest, bestest way of using my brush to get the effect I want? And then the idea was, you did enough of these, it would begin to become ingrained in your creative brain. And so that when you came to do your own work, you could bring all that knowledge. You knew what was a, a good way of um, sort of recreating the skin tone or a lighting effect or a fold of cloth or a highlight or something like that. You knew just what it took. You knew what worked. And then you could maybe do it yourself and put your, put your own spin on it. And you can do exactly the same with lighting. And this is, again, if, I don't know, who knows? Maybe you'll, maybe you'll look at this and then you'll go, whatever, I'm never going to do that again. Um, then I'd be very surprised if your lighting ever gets good. Uh, but if you do do it, I'll be able to spot it pretty quick. I'll be able to see, ah, that person knows what they're doing. And this is lighting from reference. So we're going to use the three-point lighting setup here, but we might end up, during the course of this, actually duplicating one or two of these to get a certain effect. So if we cut, so if a, if a traditional artist took a master work, a masterpiece, and um, and copied it, what can we do as lighting artists? Well, we can go to a site like Evan E. Richards who I've recommended loads and loads of times. Now, Evan E. Richards, uh, is, um, he's a cinematographer, VFX artist, director. He's a bit of everything. and But he's got this amazingly useful website where he takes films that he thinks are particularly nicely shot and lit, and uh, he takes screenshots, nice high-resolution screenshots from them all the way through the film. And these are, this is what we're going to use as... Um, our kind of for our master studies but only for lighting and I use this one because I can be fairly sure I mean I I think he's got some omissions that I think well why didn't you put that one in Richard and he's got other ones where I think why did you put that one in but um, it's uh, all down to taste eventually but let's choose one so I'm going to choose the aviator partly because the aviator has got a distinctive interesting visual look and it's got some good photography in it um, I mean, look at this. So, in some ways, this is three-point lighting, but without the key light. It's just two rim lights and a fill light. So that's really awesome and cool and interesting. Uh, so this is what I mean. You, you will look at it and you can study it. Where, where you look at her, she's not. She's lit by a key light, a little bit, a tiny, 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 tiny touch of fill light, and then a, a rim light. Maybe you're already beginning to notice it. The more you look at this, it's one of those things, if you've never thought of it before, now you will. You look at all, it doesn't matter if it's on Netflix, or you see it at the cinema, you're gonna see three-point lighting, you're gonna see rim lights, and fill lights, and key lights. But anyway, let's look through here. Also, another thing that the Aviator did, which I thought was interesting, is um, they changed the film stock, dependent on the period of time that the scenes were set in. So it had a two-strip Technicolor look at the beginning. You get these really odd, super saturated cyans really strange distinctive kind of look and I think it's quite interesting as you scroll through it quickly you can gradually see the colours change you suddenly see now that you get really super rich um, greens and blues more pure blues till it gets to the top and things look a little bit more icy and flinty and steel like That's you've got to be that nerdy for it you can't be less nerdy than that you've got to be that nerdy for it Otherwise, why are you visual artists? Um, so let's find a still and recreate it. What's something relatively simple? I'm going to choose this one. I'm choosing exactly the same one that I chose for last week's, just so it's consistent and it shows off stuff. So I'm going to find a still, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to bother with this guy. I'm not going to bother, I've got no background. I'm just going to treat as if Leonardo DiCaprio was the thing I'm lighting. 
first things first then, before I begin to try and break down what's happening with the lighting, I better reposition the camera so it's roughly in that position. Now if I'd kept the DAS rig um, active, I don't know why I didn't, that's uh, foolish of me, um, then I could have literally opposed this character in it. But instead I'm just going to reposition the camera to get approximately similar kind of setup going on here. Um, so I can see all of his head, quite a bit of his shoulder, I see both of his eyes, so that's what I'm trying to remember here. So I'm going to pull it back a bit like that. I'm going to do something like that. It's not perfect, and I'm not going to be able to get a one-to-one -one, um, sort of uh, recreation of that film still, because I can't rig the character properly, or I can't move the character, and I don't know what lens it was shot on or anything like that. I'd have to spend a bit more time. I'm going to hit that little bookmark symbol. This is something to bear in mind. Again, because of the aforementioned Maya not having undo for the camera. So I'm going to click that. And now if I do accidentally nudge my camera, um, I've now got it as this... Uh, not that one, the other one. There. So I've got it like that. Okay? So, let's go back to here and break this down. So I think we've got... We've definitely got... We've definitely got a key light. That's the most obvious thing. And that key light is coming from somewhere over here. And if you look at this, the shadow being cast by that key light, that gives me this, a, a clue that this key light is quite sharp and small because the shadow is really, really crisp and sharp just here. And it's also, that shadow is really coming in and it's almost parallel. So that light, whatever's lighting up Leo just here, is not really high up. Again, if I look at the shadow, look at the nose. The nose is always a giveaway. Look at the nose shadow. If anything, that nose shadow is going up a little bit, which hints that maybe the light's actually more parallel it could even be slightly down it's hard to tell but I know that the light is definitely not coming in from completely overhead it's coming in from more of a straight kind of angle and it's really really sharp so it's a small little light source so probably very similar to what I've already got so I'm going to start with that first and I'm not going to bother about the fill light or the rim light at all got to get that key light right everything is driven or is derived and is like a you know it's a knock-on effect to that I temporarily turned off lights in viewport off, so I'm going to put that back on so I can get a rough idea of what it's going to look like here. So, I'm going to position my light. Now, I might actually start increasing the intensity of the light here using the exposure, just so I don't have to have the light straight onto his face, you know, pushed right up against his face. So, I'm going to go back to here. So I think it's, it could do with being a bit brighter, I think. And also, let's have another look. So that side of his nose is quite in shadow. And if I'm looking at the core shadow, it kind of traces his cheekbone and his forehead here. But because I couldn't rig it in exactly the same way, I'm going to roughly look to try and get that shadow line happening on, on Leo's gorgeous face like that. So I'm going to look through the light. shift it like that. Ah, there you go, you see, look. Getting that shadow now happening on the nose. That shadow's probably pushed a bit further around still, to be honest. Looking for this kind of horizontal. And I'm not going to move on. I'm not going to move on until I'm satisfied, so it could take ages. You should not rush when you're doing this. Okay. Here's another thing to bear in mind, actually, because you don't actually have to manually create the reflected light. Thank God you used to have to do that in the dark old days before global illumination was a thing in renderer, you do get the reflected light for free. You can actually see the underside of his chin. It doesn't really show up very well on the, <coughs> on the projector, but the underside of his chin is getting some reflected light from where the light is hitting his neck and bouncing back up onto his chin. And you can see that sort of happening here, which is cool. Yeah, I'm going to say, all right, that's going to be roughly, roughly right just so I'm not here all day kind of doing it for you. Okay, so that's the key light figured out. So now let's have a look. Uh, 
Now the fill light here is really, really negligible. It's hardly there at all. Even, I mean, on the, on the projector, you're not going to see it at all. But I'm looking here on my screen, and I can just about see the tiniest, tiniest amount kind of going on there. Um, but I'm still going to put it in because I want the control. I want to be able to... I don't want to leave it to accident. I want to, I want to be the one deciding where the fill light is. So let's go back to this perspective and reposition the fill light. Now remember, if the key light was coming from that side of the camera, normally the fill light goes on the opposite side of the camera. So here's the camera, camera's angle. Let's position this up. You can already begin to see some of its effect. But it's going to be so subtle. So, so subtle here. Because again, here's another thing to look at. See this bit? This is nice core. This is like the core shadow of his body, of his shoulder. And it goes really dark just here. So I'm positioning the light just here. And let's see what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. So again, now on the monitor, it's difficult to see. It's a bit dark, but it's too much. Too much. So I'm going to bring this down something like eight it's getting darker still maybe you see maybe what I want to do so I want to control the transition from key light to core shadow and I'm looking at there I'm looking as looking close in and seeing what happens to that that core shadow line so I think it was was it at 10 before that's way too much way too much so down to eight something more like that maybe it's very very subtle Now let's look at, so we've got this nice rim light happening here. This is the thing, and notice that's the rim light. Why is there a rim light there? Because you've got this dark, fuzzy, out of focus background. And that rim light is the opposite of dark and fuzzy and out of focus. It's crisp and it's graphic, so it really pops Leo out of the frame. That's why it's there. So we want the same thing. So I'm going to stop that, and I'm going to get my rim light. And I'm going to position it. Make sure it's pointing in the right direction. Just here. Now, what I think is interesting about this rim light is it's casting onto his face, but it's not casting onto his body. Purely, it's like it must be a very, very small focused light pointing just on his face because his body's not important. Everything, the focal point of the image is obviously the person's face because they're talking. It's not this um, awesome, lovely jumper. It's just this kind of thing going on here. So this is very consciously deciding not to have the rim light go onto his body. So that's, I don't want that to happen. So I might need to shrink the rim light down. So I'm going to put it just here. I bet it's going to be too much because Maya has big problems in the viewport showing you that um, that kind of wrapping effect. Yeah, so it's too much. So let's move it down. And I'm going to shrink it down. Because I think it would be a smaller. Let's have a look at that. Still too much, isn't it? So it's going to move further behind him, maybe a little bit away, like this. So I'm going to compare, so there you go. none of that rim light gets onto his kind of top lip. A little teeny bit gets onto the underside of his nose. As I mentioned, I'm going to have trouble getting that exact because I can't rig his, I can't move his face to exactly the same degree. But it's still too much anyway. Further move it. It's getting more like it. That's what I want. Yeah. I reckon that's that's about as good as I'm going to get it here. But look, I've got this problem here. It's happening on his body. And it's definitely not happening here. So how can I get rid of that? Um, well, I can use that spread parameter. So I can, at the moment, that, that light is coming from all kind of angles outwards. So if I change the spread parameter, I should be able to focus it in a little bit more. So let's try something quite extreme like 0 0.25. 0 0.1. 
Okay, I'm getting this noisy kind of effect going on here. But this is more what I want to happen. I want to focus exactly where that rim light is casting. And I want it to be just like that. Okay? Now, so we're kind of getting there. But look, we've got another rim light happening. And it's much, much more subtle. The other rim light is coming off from the side here. You could almost say also there's a tiny little bit of uh, light coming from the top. It might be difficult to see. No, you can see it on the projector. You can see a little bit of soft light just topping, touching the top of his hair just here. Again, that just it stops his hair, which would otherwise, if that wasn't there, his hair would be this massive darkness against a massive darkness. So it would be difficult to see. And the rim light is just there to pick him out from the background. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to create another light and try and get this effect, because I think this is really important. And what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to copy my key lights to do this. If you want to duplicate something in Maya, if you're still new to Maya, select it, Control D. So I'm going to move this around. I'm beginning to see it just here. Let's just shine it. That maybe, probably a little bit further behind, a little bit to the side. Let's see what that looks like. Just it's not going to be right first go, unless I'm very lucky. Yeah, it's too much at the moment, but it's getting there. It's so going to move it further behind. Kind of getting there. It's too bright though. This is really, really subtle, soft, low intensity rim light. Rim lights don't always have to be super strong. So let's bring this down quite a lot. Let's bring it down to six. That's going to be a lot. Ah, yes, it's hardly there now. This is more like it. Maybe it could be a little bit brighter. Don't want it too bright. It's always going to be, your temptation is always going to be to over egg everything. Subtlety. So you see what you're getting now? We're accentuating now that core shadow effect on his shoulder. Which is pushing, of course, the more things we've got going on, the more passive highlight. So this is the passive highlight. There's the active highlight. There's the core shadow. There's a very, very small amount of fill, not much at all. There's the cast shadow. And then what we don't get in that breakdown, but more the artistic thing, then we're getting these rim lights that are pulling him out from the background. I'm going to add one more just to the top of his head because I think that's uh, an important one. Again, I'm going to duplicate this light because I have a feeling that the light on top of his head is a similar kind of level as the one just here, so it's much more subtle. So, Control D. Oops. Control D again. And I'm going to position this Maybe make this a bit bigger, like this, and put this directly over the top of his head. And what I might do, actually, if you get, like, again, if you're getting mixed up here with the um, rotations, it's all getting a bit wonky, uh, you can reset the transformations, go to the little box, and just click off scale and um, translate, and just do rotation. So now it's, it's defaulted back to that kind of position. So I can position this just overhead. Let's see what that looks like. I want the, the subtlest, subtlest of kind of lights going on here. So I need to move this back a little bit. Maybe increase the intensity. Not my much. I just want. See, that's too much. And the positioning isn't quite right. something like that but even it, even that's too much bring that down to seven there we go right so what what I've done then is taken that aviator still and I've tried to reverse engineer where I think the lights were to get that effect it didn't take too long and it was fun um, so I want you to do the same for a good chunk of time now I want you to get onto Evany Richards 
and I want you to find a film still. It doesn't have to be from the Aviator. It can be from anything. Although, don't procrastinate too much. Don't kind of spend 20 minutes just trying to find the right film. Just get in there and choose anything. It doesn't have to be a super dramatic kind of shot. It could be something as basic as that. Now, this is actually something. You look at this maybe and you think, oh, well, Braveheart, that hasn't got any lighting now. I can't see any lighting going on. Then they just take the camera out and just click on and just record what the, was happening. Even when you're shooting exterior shots, there are still a ton of lights that you can't see getting that, the effect that the director wants. Now, the lights are going to be softer, especially if they're, the lighting conditions they're in are overcast, as they are in this respect, but there are still key lights, fill lights, and rim lights kind of going on, okay? So, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And I'm going to take a little bit of a wander around in a few moments and see how you're getting on.
Okay, right. Um, so we're going to do one more thing before uh, the end of the day, and that's uh, how do you do, how do you bring this kind of approach to doing environments? Uh, this is a case where what I would do now, if I were you, I'd load up that that village scene because it's quite a biggie. Because I want to talk about the danger of overlighting, which is again something that um, I think beginners do a lot. this machine's even going to manage to load up that scene. It is a fairly heavy scene. If not, that's okay. I can still show you the um, <clears throat> what I mean by this. <gasps> you can do it. Come on. Okay. That's cool. That's good. Right. <laughs> I actually don't need the Maya scene that much in some ways because it's more about um, the overlighting. Uh, so, the, yeah, the most common mistake that uh, I think students and beginners are going to make when they're doing any kind of CG stuff, and I even saw it just now when I was walking around, and that was just like the three point lighting setup. And I, I don't mean to get at you, but just it's good that in some ways that you do make that mistake. So you, I can say, oh, you overlit it, you overlit it, your light's too bright. But um, yeah, regardless of whether you're doing stuff in CG or whether you're painting stuff, is that you're going to overlight things. Um, if you're lighting something and you want it to look aesthetically pleasing, you want it to look atmospheric, you want it to sort of tell some kind of story or give some kind of vibe, um, don't be afraid of letting some parts of the, your character or your environment just get lost in shadow, okay? Uh, there's one exception to this um, and that's if you're doing um, architectural visualisation if you're doing that kind of lighting and I don't think concept artists are going to be doing much of that although CGI and VFX people and games people could very well end up doing that uh, because games engines are getting so good at rendering now um, that they can rival the look of something like an Arnold render or a V-Ray or Redshift uh, and they're also interactive it means that architects quite like the idea of doing architectural visualization in a game engine because your client now can walk around so to speak the the space and see what it's going to look like that's a case where you could where um, over lighting is almost required um, if you're not if you're not uh, up on architectural visualization then they, it's essentially this kind of look. It's super bright, super clean. It's like the opposite of atmospheric um, because you know it has to look pristine because they're trying to sell it to someone corporate or they're trying to sell it to someone and it's almost not going to have character because you as the buyer want to put your character onto it. So arch viz um, stuff tends to look really crisp and overlit. That's quite a good one, isn't it, in terms of realism? But um, I have a feeling that most of you at the moment uh, are more interested in creating um, cool looking stuff that looks um, like it could be from, you know, I don't know, uh, something story based, something fancy sci-fi-ish or horror or whatever like that. So you don't want to overlit stuff, but it's going to be your first instinct because uh, I've modelled it. I put so many hours into modelling it. Oh God, I put so much texturing, and I really thought about every single last bit of the texture. And and I don't want it to be falling into shadow where you can't see it. That's wasted work, isn't it? It's not, uh, because unless it's com been complete pitch black shadow, and even then you might still see the silhouette of the object. All of the calculations in your rendering and all the painting that you do, um, it's still going to 
combine with the lack of lighting and the small amounts of fill lighting to give you the overall look. And anyway, how good your texturing is and how good your modeling is or how good your drawing is of that hut by the side of the road, it's all secondary and it doesn't mean anything if it detracts from the story and the feel and the atmosphere of the piece you want to create. Okay, so forget about trying to show every single little bit, last bit of geometry. I'm coming at this from a concept art and a CG point of view because of the intro to CG project. Like a couple of people, I think, after chatting with some of their friends and chatting with me, um, got brave and allowed bits of their Mars base to go into darkness. And guess what? Their work looks better for it. It looks way more interesting. Um, so don't overlight stuff. Uh, I'm going to show you what I mean by that with these overlit with that village, and if you overlight light that village. So there's a lot of geometry in this village scene, right? So you want to see every single last bit of it. So if you overlight it, yeah, you can see every single last bit of it, but it looks terrible. It's got no atmosphere at all. It looks um, it kind of almost looks like a little miniature model set, which again would be okay if that's what you meant it to look like. But if you did want it to look like a Wild West kind of um, scene, well, that clearly doesn't look like a Wild West scene, and it just has no atmosphere, no kind of um, no sense of storytelling. That's just done by there's just one uh, sky dome light set to white, just lighting everything. So yeah, I can see every single last bit of modelling, and it's awesome and everything, but uh, it's a dull image, and um, I wouldn't be very impressed to see that. Similar thing, if you weren't doing it with say you were thinking oh yeah I really want a sunset scene so I'm gonna go a little bit towards getting a sunset scene so I'm gonna have a sky this time that's got sunset -y colors going on but when I put it in and I lit it with that sunset light everything was in shadow and I got scared because you can't see anything so I chucked some more lights into it so that at least you can see some stuff here but again it's kind of killed in terms of atmosphere and mood this is why Think of the story, think of, think of the mood you're trying to tell and start placing lights methodically, one by one, that tell that story and to hell with everything else, okay? So if we wanted to go for a sunset you see, in fact what I did with this um, is that, okay? So I thought, right, I don't care if this stuff goes into darkness, and it's not going into complete darkness by any um, stretch of the imagination, but it doesn't matter, it's not detracting from the mother and daughter kind of figure in the sort of mid-ground, because that's what this scene's actually meant to be about. Everything else, I don't care that this gets all fuzzy and hazy. All of the stuff's still there, all the model, and it all combines with the haze, and if you zoom in close enough, you can still get a feeling of this. It all adds to that, that atmosphere and feel. Now, when I started lighting this, I treated it exactly like I did those lighting... Um, the characters from reference. The only difference was instead of choosing a close-up of a character I chose a wide shot and what I did was I went for, I chose a western because it's a western isn't it? I chose the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Crawford which is an interesting film to watch if you haven't seen it. Um, it's got some very very distinctive cinematography by Roger Deakins and he's also one of my favourites. He's a British cinematographer, getting on a bit now, and he always works with the Coen brothers um, these days. Uh, if you got the DVD or Blu-ray of Wally, the Pixar film, there is an amazing, um, upsettingly short, though, little extra on it, because Roger Deakins was called in to Pixar to chat with the lighting artists. Um, because they wanted to make their, they wanted to up their game on the lighting for Wally. They wanted it to feel um, sort of both more naturalistic, but also they felt that they were missing some kind of magic secret source um, that maybe a cinematographer, a live action cinematographer, um, especially one as accomplished uh, as Roger Deakins, might be able to give. So he came in and he gave them a talk, and it's on the extras of it, and it's, it's as I mentioned, it's short. But it's very, very sweet. So um, if you have got that, watch it or watch it again. Because uh, he knows what he's talking about, Roger Deakins. He's someone who also is not afraid of using justified light and pushing it to the point where you can hardly see anything else. He's very distinctive, um, d deliberately bad lenses. 
on this film as well, to have a lot of blurring. Um, almost makes you feel like you've got some kind of macular degenerative kind of disease going on. But notes again, distinctive light, distinctive light sources coming from here. Not afraid that this goes totally black. Doesn't matter. Um, he's got some shots in here that are in a completely black backlit. You can't see anything at all. And they're also super simple. Just silhouettes. Anyway, I went in here and I was looking through, I mean, this was one. Just two light sources in this shot. Backlight and a little bit of sort of what this might be called an accent light. Just adds a little bit of accent, a little bit of flavour to something. But apart from that, it's really, really simple. But it's still really balanced. Nothing's burning out. Nothing looks like it, it oh, something's wrong. Nothing looks like it, it was done by chance. But anyway, I went to, where is it? This one. I wanted to get roughly this kind of feel, this vibe. So I looked at it and thought, what's going on here? Um, it's almost monochromatic. Uh, it's kind of sunsetty or sunrisey, but it doesn't feel very warm, I don't think. It feels like a very cool kind of um, temperature to it all. It feels a bit frosty. Um, and it's also extremely hazy as well. So this is the key things I wanted to get when I lit my environment. I mean, it's a completely different scene setup and stuff. So in this case, I wasn't trying to get a one-to-one -one copy of this because I, I wasn't going to... I wanted to do a lighting exercise. I didn't want to do a modelling or texturing exercise. Um, so I just chose that Western scene that I've got because it was roughly similar. So I thought, right, it's got to have lots of haze. I probably could have gone higher. could have put even more haze. Uh, if I wanted to simulate that look. But I knew that haze was important and the kind of monochromatic kind of feel was important. And even though in that film still, Brad Pitt's character isn't highlighted, I wanted to be creative and I thought those two figures should be highlighted. So I'm going to treat it as if they were uh, the characters and they had to be lit. They were the focal point. Everything else is secondary to making sure that they're the focal point. So we're not using a key and fill light in this, um, in this time to sculpt and mould the 3D geometry of their faces we're using key and fill light this time to focus our attention on them, the important thing and we treat it a little bit different but still roughly the same kind of attitude to it uh, this is roughly how you should kind of treat your kind of wide shots of your environments anyway uh, you should think of them as stage sets even though they're in CG and you can go anywhere you can put the camera anywhere you like and even though you might be trying to um, replicate how film kind of lighting works, think of it as just a stage set. And you need a spotlight to spotlight your actor. And that spotlight, it's a spotlight in theatre, but in film that spotlight is your key light again. So it all comes back to that kind of thing. So the key light has to pick these two out, everything else secondary. So just enough fill to stop it going completely pitch black. If anything, these things are easier to do, I think. There's less light set up than there is doing a face, even though you're doing an entire environment. There are a couple of things extra, though, that I want to show you. And they're kind of Maya specific and they're kind of environment specific. Um, let's hope that this renders. So the whole scene is lit with three lights. One of those lights isn't even technically lighting the scene either. I'm just going to turn these down to zero. So I'm going to hide them, and I do treat it very slightly in a slight different order than when I'm doing a character. So I start off with a, um, a sky dome. Now this is going to be, maybe I should have gone in here and actually just called this fill light, because that's all the sky dome is, just a fill light. The sky is going to have the most, um, the biggest impact on how dark things get if it's an exterior scene, and that's what the fill light's for controlling how dark do things actually get. And I want to do with the, uh, the fill light first for an environment. It's because I'm dealing with a, a, a bigger space, lots of things to look at. If I was going to deal with it with just a key light first, I would only see our two little actors and I wouldn't see anything else at all. So I'm tackling it in a slightly different order when it comes to environment. I'm not saying you shan't or couldn't go in and do it the other way around, but I'm just saying what my personal preference is in this case. So um, let's have a look see what it looks like with just the fill light. I hope that it renders and doesn't crash because it is quite a big scene, as I mentioned. 
should be okay because there's no textures in this scene. Oh, wrong camera. Right one. There we go, right camera. So, this is the fill light. So there's no direct light source going on. You still get a sense of a little pool of light. Well, no, we don't actually. That's a bit of material. That's not a pool of light. But you can see some kind of rough, fuzzy lighting happening here. Uh, and this is because this is a special kind of sky dome light I'm using. Uh, you could use a HDRI image in here. Um, if you don't know what a HDRI image is, it's uh, an image of the environment that's a 360 degree image of the environment. But it's not just that. It's a 360 degree image of the environment where multiple levels of exposure and brightness are baked into it. And um, if you went to see Alex Thorne, I think his name was, or Alex Horn, do the talk um, uh, the other day or the other week, um, then he was using HDRIs to light things like The Lion King. Um, so you can use a HDRI and you can get loads of free ones online. In fact, a, I don't know why you'd ever buy one. If you just wanted one, um, you don't need to steal it. <laughs> Uh, HDRI Haven is your one-stop shop for an amazing amount of useful HDRIs. 100% free, all of them in multiple resolutions. All of them. This guy, I feel like chucking this guy some money because he, he's done such a lovely job. So you can go for one like there, and you've got choice. You can even get 16K HDRI. Unbelievable. So um, that's what a HDRI can be used for, and it can be very good for making stuff look very naturalistic straight away. Almost zero effort, you can make it look naturalistic. This is not, though, a HDRI. This is a physical sky. It's something like this in all 3D packages. It's kind of um, procedurally generated sky system where you control the elevation, which is the obviously the up and downness. The closer to the horizon, the lower the number. Uh, the higher the number, the more overhead it is, more like midday. And in this sun and sky, um, it will automatically change the colour of the sky. So as it gets towards zero, it will get darker and redder. And as it gets towards 90, it will get brighter and whiter. Um, so I'm using it this just for the, you know, because I don't have to worry about texture. I didn't want, basically, I didn't want to give you a, a scene where we'd spend 10 minutes just trying to remap and path textures. Um, so this is why nothing's got a texture in it. And we're using this kind of light. Uh, so it's, but it's still totally useful. Now, there are a couple of things I've done here. By default, when you create a sun and skylight, it's got this thing called Enable Sun switched on. So if I click that on, not only will it give you the skylight, but it will cast direct light shadows as well. Um, which can be useful, but our, I'm an artist. I'm on control over it. And I don't want to be fiddling around with these two weird numbers to get just the right... It's unintuitive. It's difficult to kind of figure out to get the shadows where you want them to be when you're fiddling around with two numbers like this. So instead, I'm going to click that off. And I'm going to be using, I'm going to be using my own direct light source to decide where the sun's going to go. So that's why that's off. You can have that on if you want. I'm just saying that if you want total control and you want easy control, maybe turn that off. The other thing to bear in mind here is this thing called turbidity, which is quite cool. Um, that, that Jesse James, um, Robert Crawford shot, is a, it's very, 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 very hazy. Um, and that's what turbidity kind of simulates. Now, it doesn't give you the volumetric haze, but it will change the color. It will pretend, it will fake that kind of pollution in the atmosphere. Essentially, the higher this number, the more particles, technically, there are in the air and the more hazy it will look. Okay, so it's quite a nice little number. But you can further go in and tint the sky color as well to just exacerbate that even more. This way is the more scientifically accurate way. This way is the more arty kind of way. But all you really care about is getting a nice image. So you can use them both, as long as you understand what both do. But I click this off because I don't want the sun. So that was the first light I added to the scene. And I fiddled around with the intensity until I got it just the way I wanted it to look. So I was quite happy with this falling into total darkness. But I thought, this is about as dark as I want everything to kind of go. And I'm okay with the ambient light everywhere else. It was the next thing I added into the scene. 
actually was not the direct light source. The next thing I'm adding into the scene is this area light that isn't a light, so to speak. There's an enormous amount of haze in that, um, that scene. So I wanted that, I literally wanted some volumetric fuzzy kind of haze going on. Um, it's best to show you this maybe from a different viewport. So, this is what this area of light is. It's a ginormous area of light underneath the ground, and it's had its shadows switched off. Whenever you create a new light in uh, Maya, especially, I don't know if it's what it's like for rendering, because I hardly ever go here unless it's this light here, the direct light source. I like to stay to Arnold render lights. Because Arnold wants to render everything 100% realistically, um, it just goes, well, why would you not want shadows on it? So this little box is ticked on by mistake. This is one of the rare cases where I don't want shadows because I'm going to put the whole light underneath the ground. Some of my concept lot will maybe remember this because we talked about it a little bit in Intro to CGI. If you switch shadows off, put it under the ground, turn everything else off in this visibility section, apart from volume, then all this light is going to be is a bit like a smoke machine just going to sit there below the ground so it's just going to belch out a very very even layer of fog into the scene uh, you won't see any um, any actual results from this though unless you go into the render settings which is here little cog on the clapperboard you go to Arnold renderer and then in environment you add an atmosphere volume if you click this button here um, it will give you an option. It will only give you two options, to be honest. It will say fog or it will say volume, and you want volume. And then I gave it a tiny little number. By default, the number will be zero, so you won't, still won't see anything. So I'm giving this just one, 0 0.1, and this is such a sensitive number. Anything more than that is going to completely flood your scene. All my other lights, well, I haven't got any other lights, to be honest. Um, any other lights you added to the scene, if I was to add in a new area light now, it would cast volumetric smoke into the scene because by default all lights coming in have these numbers set to one so it, the visibility is um, you can see it in the diffuse shading the specular shading subsurface scattering the indirect and the volume what I want to do is I want to make every light not contribute to volume but only this light okay and it's a bit a bit confusing when you give it a go um, I'll come around and, and I'll help you out the gist of it is this light is only emitting a thin, even amount of fog into the scene. So let's have a look what it looks like now. So now it's adding our fog into the scene. Um, how much fog? Well, that's controlled by two things controlled by the lightness even though this light is not actually illuminating anything if it was you would see some underlighting happening it's only just emitting some fog into the scene I can control the the amount of fog by changing the um, exposure so if I could put like 10 in here whoa nuclear apocalypse still quite pretty cool though I like that because look what's nice about the fog here is that it doesn't it goes through a nice colorful gradient it doesn't it doesn't look dead it doesn't just go from one color through grays to the next color it, it actually goes through different colors which I think is um, very nice was it five I think I had it on wasn't it so you can control it here or you can get the overall feel of it and then you can change this number put this slider down and that will reduce the fog as well until you put it down to nothing it's not contributing to the fog at all we're back to that situation where only the sky dome's there put this up to one which is what it will be like by default we got the full amount of fog now you can further go in again and change it by adding a light decay but we won't go into that now that would be lighting advanced not lighting basic um, so that was the next thing I added so this was to define my overall maximum amount of haze going on and then the final thing is this direct light which is just so it's not in the Arnold settings. This is the one case I would go to the normal Maya rendering and add a direct light source. Never, ever, ever 
touch these without written permission. Only, only this one, okay? So I've got a direct light source. Now remember, a direct light source is a direct light source. So it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. All that matters is where it's pointing. Um, let's put the light it. Let's put the shading on. And let's press this and hope it doesn't die. And let's put shadows on. <gasps> well, it, that's not very good, is it? Shadows aren't particularly good in the viewport. Not so much of a help in this case. Um, yeah, terrible. <laughs> so this is a case where you are better off doing a render. So the reason I wanted, remember, um, you can have, remember, the lighting, the sun switched on here. But then to control where the shadows happen, I have to tweak these weird numbers to get it happening. Whereas if I turn that off and use a direct light source, now I can control exactly where I want the shadows to happen. Because where I wanted, I wanted the shadows to happen, like this, I wanted them to be caught in a pool of light, I wanted this to be in shadow because I wanted to separate them from the background. Again, think contrast, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. Have that happening in your scene for maximum uh, depth. And I wanted also, I just wanted this feeling of um, the top of this telegraph pole to be sort of peeking into the light because I thought that was a nice touch. Um, but if I tried to do that with the light setting in the sky dome, I, could, I probably could do it, but it'd be so tricky adding in numbers here and then doing a rendering and seeing if it's r roughly the right place. Plus the fact that I've now detached, also by changing these numbers in here, I'll be changing the illumination of the scene because there will, because it's a procedural system, depending on the elevation, depending on the azimuth, the light and quality and colour and brightness changes. I was happy with the overall ambient light now I want to be in control of where the direct light goes. So I don't know. So if I, if I render this now, it's exporting it. I could control exactly where it's going to go. So if I, so I had to just I essentially had to add the area light in, and I had to tweak this until it looked how I wanted it to look. So I wanted that happy thing where it was coming in through the gap in the buildings, hitting these, putting them in a pool of light, but then making sure everything else was in kind of shadow. So just three lights. That's all it took. It's not overlit. I did some other stuff in Photoshop. The only stuff I did in Photoshop was add um, a little bit of colour grading, just if because you, you want it to get even darker, then it's better to do that in Photoshop. And I did some uh, noise and... Um, a little bit of chromatic aberration. That was it. So, there's not much time left of the session. Um, although there's no one booked in here afterwards, so you can always um, stay here pretty much as long as you want. Although I won't be staying here for, for too much long, uh, time afterwards. Load up that village scene, um, and it won't have any lights in it, your version. Light it. Don't copy my lighting. Think of another kind of lighting. You don't have to copy in this case you don't necessarily have to copy something directly from here but maybe be inspired by something it could be as simple as that that would be the easiest thing to try and do but light that village scene and don't over light it okay cool okay um for the advanced lighting thing we're going to be looking a little bit more at uh we will be looking at a bit of architectural visualization uh, we'll be looking at things like portal lights uh, when you're lighting interiors, because lighting interiors is a little bit tricky, a little bit more complicated in some ways. Uh, and then we will be sort of touching on IES lighting and kind of kit bashing in a sort of roundabout way, because um, I want to show you how to again CG, uh, VF, um, sorry no concept art students for their intro to CGI in some ways already know this. Where is it? Um, wait a second. So something like lighting this kind of sort of setup. I might go through a bit of that. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Cool. All right then. So yeah, give this a go. I'm gonna have a sandwich.